Uh, thanks very much for the introduction, and thanks very much for inviting me to speak here. It's very exciting. My first time in Israel, and so it's, it's a certainly a new experience for me. Um, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about what we're doing at GraphCore, and uh, as we're trying to accelerate machine intelligence workloads. Um, before I dive into a bit more detail, I just want to tell you a little bit about these images that you'll see through these presentations. Um, these are actually representations of, of neural networks that come about um, as part of our, our programming tool chain. And so this is actually a representation of a, a ResNet 50, and it just kind of shows you the level of, of, of detail and parallelism that's within these networks. The first time we show these to a lot of people, they often ask, kind of, what are those? Are those kind of biological structures or something? Um, so it, it's an interesting representation of, of these network structures. So who are GraphCore? I, I suspect many of you have never heard of us before. Um, so, so we're a, a small startup, um, and we're building technology, building hardware processors um, that are really designed to allow um, innovators, the people who are developing new models um, and really driving this space forward, to create the next generation of machine intelligence. So we're really focused on building these flexible hardware platforms that will allow um, you to innovate and really drive this field forward. Um, so we're building these processes. We'll be integrating those into, uh, into products, primarily kind of PCIe form factor accelerated cards, um, and, and bring those to the market. Um, we're a startup company with extremely strong backing from some of the um, leading um, venture capital firms around the world, as well as some of the um, leading individual um, people within um, the artificial intelligence space. And we're based in Bristol primarily, and we have also have offices in Oslo uh, and Palo Alto, and we are expanding very rapidly. So if you're looking for an interesting new challenge, please go and have a look at our website and, and see if there's anything there that, that's interesting for you. So I, I talked a little bit about that we're trying to build new processes. Why do we need to build new processes for AI? Why does this, this workload require um, a new processor architecture? And, and really, we, we see the artificial intelligence workload as a completely new domain. Um, it's kind of compute 2.0. It's, it's very, very different to any kind of computational structure that we've seen before. So if you look back over the past kind of 30, 40, 50 years, um, we've been programming our computer systems in pretty much the same way. Maybe not sitting at the terminal, as this lady is in this picture, but we've programmed them kind of step by step in a, in a very um, a programmatic, terministic fashion. We've, we've laid out the problem that we're going to map onto the machine. And um, that works great when you have a specific algorithm that you want to write. You can um, sort of describe that algorithm, that set of maths, and then you can um, apply that to the hardware. It doesn't work so well if you've got a, a problem that you can't describe efficiently in an algorithmic way, and it also doesn't work if you've got a problem that's too complex to be described efficiently in that kind of algorithmic way. And so um, for these machine intelligence workloads, these new kind of AI workloads, we've taken a different approach, and rather than try and describe an, an algorithm that explicitly solves the problem, we, um, we learn how to um, solve that problem. So we, we build a model and then we train that model on data and it's actually that training process that's embedding information within the model and that's allowing us to solve a much more complicated model. So we're, we're kind of um, taking a set of data and we're learning from that data and, that, and that's I think the unique thing about these workloads and they really sort of translate into a completely different computational workload. So before we look at that workload, what's really behind um, the revolution in machine intelligence. So there's a few things, and we heard about a few of these from, that, from the last speaker as well, and some of the speakers this morning. So clearly, the access to very large volumes of data is, is critical to enabling this. If we want to be able to train these models, um, having these, um, these data resources is, is very important. Um, and in addition, having some of that at least being labeled really helps the, the training process. So the first thing is, is what the system knows. The second thing is, is having better algorithms, richer models. These have rapidly been evolving over the past um, years uh, and even sort of weeks and months. So I really struggle to keep up with the state of the art on archive at the moment. It's moving so fast. 
Um, and then finally, the other critical thing that's been enabling these new technologies is new hardware. So actually the ability to just process this data and, and, and run these kind of learning algorithms is, is critical. So GPUs have really opened up this space. Um, you heard from the previous speaker that Google's developing their own custom hardware for this kind of space. And so we really believe that the dedicated um, high performance hardware is critical to enabling the next generation of, of these machine intelligence workloads. And so if we look at what we're actually doing within one of these engines, um, we really sort of have this kind of workflow. We're taking this training data or potentially our sensor data and we're feeding it in and then we're doing one of two things. We're either building a knowledge model, so through a training process, um, we're running through our inference pipeline, um, feed, um, assessing ourselves against a loss function and then building up and back propagating through that network to build up our knowledge model. So that's, that's the training process. It's fundamentally built around an inference engine. And then when we want to uh, make a prediction, we do exactly the same thing. We, we take our sensor data, we feed it in, and we use that knowledge model and that inference engine to make a prediction. And so we fundamentally see that the, um, the processing that we're doing is the same irrespective of whether we're doing inference or whether we're doing training. And so we really regard this as two sides of the same coin. And when we look at what is actually within that computational workload, we see it is, it is a completely new workload um, to anything that we've seen before. It doesn't look like a, a sort of a high density matrix arithmetic that you might do if you're um, solving a weather model or if you're doing kind of big linear algebra calculations. It's completely different to that. So it is massively parallel. If you look at the, the, the size of these networks, they may have millions, hundreds of millions of, of um, parameters within them, and they may have billions of connections between those parameters, so the, the dendrites that the previous um, speaker was talking about. Um, these data structures are also fundamentally sparse. So um, they're sparse for a couple of reasons. Um, so there's significant sparsity in the layers within these networks. Uh, and there's also significant sparsity from the, the dimension mismatch that you have when you take a very um, sparse network, so a, a network that, or a, a very highly parallel network with lots of neurons and lots of layers connected to each other, and you embed that within a one-dimensional memory. And so we have to be able to cope with these um, very, very sparse data structures. Um, they're low precision, so they don't require 64-bit dull precision numerical arithmetic, um, really we're focused on, on much, much lower precision and we're aggregating together the combination of lots of different low precision operations to create a single higher precision um, sort of decision at the end. Um, so we're really interested in, in low precision, potentially high numeric range operations. Um, there is scope for quite a lot of clever parameter reuse within these networks, particularly if we're doing recurrence or if we've got convolutions, um, we can actually um, make clever reuse of these of parameters to reduce the, the computational complexity or the memory bandwidth requirements of these structures. Uh, and they're also fundamentally sparse. So we, when we're running through these networks, we don't see the, the structure of the networks change very much. We might be updating the weights and we might be learning slowly as we're running through, but the, the structure of the computation tends to be relatively static. And then finally, there's a requirement for the ability to generate entropy, so inject randomness or noise, do stochastic rounding. And so we believe that these are the kind of fundamental characteristics that are going to define um, these next generation um, compute networks and compute workloads. And so if we think about what might limit the performance of such a, a, a machine intelligence processor, there are clearly a number of things that, that could be important and we need to make sure we, we cover. Um, there's the rate of compute. I mean, that's fundamental. That's often the first thing that everyone looks at. So we saw sort of teraflop ratings on, um, on the previous speaker's talk. And, and if we're looking at the headline numbers, this is the one that everyone focuses on. However, there are other things that are also critically important. Memory access, the ability to feed that compute engine is, is very, very important. And both bandwidth and latency of access to memory, um, the, if you have low latency and high bandwidth access, you can be much more flexible in the kind of algorithms that you can tolerate. Um, you have to be able to cope with that sparsity in the data. And really what this means is you have to be able to generate addresses and do kind of large-scale gather and scatter operations into your memory spaces efficiently. 
Um, you may be limited by the, um, the rate of um, entropy generation within the system. If you want to be able to do random number generation on every cycle to do a, a random bias or something like that, that could be important. If you want to do stochastic rounding on every result, um, you clearly need to be able to generate um, those curves, um, the, um, the bell curves, to do your stochastic rounding efficiently. That can't be expensive. And then finally, the interconnect is going to be critically important within one of these processes to allow you to move data around. If we look back at a kind of a, a biological example, the human brain is dominated by interconnect rather than the kind of the processing elements. Um, and we also see that the, um, for efficient implementation of, of computer chips, this is also important. Um, these, these diagrams actually represent um, something called Rent's Rule um, that was discovered by a, um, an IBM researcher, um, uh, I think it was in the, uh, the 60s, um, which related the, uh, the, the size of a, um, any partition within a silicon chip um, to the, um, the amount of interconnect you needed around it. And they actually found later that this applied to, uh, um, to organic structures as well, to biological structures. And so um, having a high performance interconnect to allow you to move data around um, within a chip is, is critically important. And so pulling that together, we really believe a fundamentally new kind of processor is, to, um, is required for these kinds of workloads. So we have CPUs that are optimized for, for single threaded scalar workloads. We have GPUs that are great at dense matrix multiplication, um, but are less flexible when it comes to, to sparse structures and, and entropy generation. And so we're developing a new kind of process, so we call it the Intelligence Processing Unit, the IPU, and it's really optimized for kind of graph-style um, neural structures, the kinds that we see um, in, these, in these workloads. And what it really implements is a, a, a new kind of approach for solving these problems. So I, I've described the, the computational workload we have as being um, massively parallel, a relatively static graph, and we have a relatively predictable um, amount of compute within this. And so really, that, that suits a purely distributed processor architecture. What I mean by a purely distributed architecture is we have lots and lots of individual processing elements. Each of those processing elements have private local memory on them, and so these can run completely independently, uh, and then we connect those together with a flexible exchange structure to allow us to move data around. And so we can partition work across those, we can partition and allocate memory across those, but there's a real challenge there, which is how we um, move data between these processes. How do we allow them to communicate efficiently, cheaply at high bandwidth, and without suffering the kind of concurrency hazards that you get in almost every um, programming paradigm that you have today. And the way we solve that problem is we use um, quite a novel parallelization strategy. It's called the bulk synchronous parallel approach, and it, it's a fairly simple bridging model for parallel machines. It's very easy to program. It means you don't have to worry about um, live locks, dead locks, synchronization. All of those things are, are sort of solved for you fundamentally within the, the programming paradigm. It's actually kind of very widely used. If you've ever used a, a MapReduce model or a kind of a Hadoop style architecture, that implements a, a BSP style approach at the node scale. And we believe we're the first people to actually be kind of mad enough to try and implement this inside a processor. And so we use this um, at the very fundamental workload level within our processor. What we actually do within this approach is we have a set of tasks. So the blocks of color in this picture are um, computational tasks. And we've, we've sort of allocated these across um, our five processor in this example. And we can see we, we kind of work through these tasks. These will be working against the private local memory that we have on each of our processors. Um, and then we hit a synchronization barrier. And so every one of our processes is going to wait for all of the other tasks to complete at that synchronization barrier. We then are in a completely known deterministic state. Um, and so we can go and go into an exchange. We can move data around. We don't have to worry that somebody else might be processing because we know that everyone's finished. And so we can move data around very freely. And then um, when, as we're going into the next phase, we know exactly what data we're going to move around. And so we can, um, as soon as the final piece of data that we need has arrived and we've sent our last byte out, we can start moving into our next phase of, um, of computation. And then we just repeat that over and over. If we look at what this looks like in the real execution, this is actually an example of, of ResNet 50 um, in an inference mode um, executing on our hardware. Um, we can see that this is really what it looks like. So this is a, um, a sort of a linear um, 
stream that's just been wrapped around so that it fits onto a slide. Um, we have compute in blue, um, we have exchange in yellow, um, and then there is some, some areas where we're, we're saving power and we're idling down in certain scenarios. And um, particularly there are some big blocks of teal in this that are where the um, compiler guys have still got a bit more work to do in terms of optimizing this. So um, there's some sort of uh, scope for improvement here. Um, what we can see in this is um, we've got a, a very, very fine granularity of compute and execution here, and we're able to maintain very high equalization across the entire device, um, despite the fact that intuitively this kind of explicit serialization of compute and exchange would seem to be a bad idea. So this actually works out really, really well for these kind of architectures and allows us to have a very, very simple programming um, environment, allows it to make it very, very usable for people writing new, new code for these devices. So the other thing that, that our architecture allows us to kind of address is um, the problem of, of delivering memory bandwidth. And so really, if you've got a new processor, you can make the core um, computational rate for a new processor kind of 10 times faster. That's not too difficult to do. We actually saw an example of similar to that when, when Intel, uh, sorry, NVIDIA went from their um, P100 generation of GPUs to the V100 generation of GPUs. They implemented a completely new functional block within that um, called the Tensor Core. And, and that gave them a, I think it was a 6x improvement in, in peak floating point performance in one generation. That, that's a, a very significant bump. However, they couldn't move the memory interface that they have on that system by anywhere near as much. I think they had about a 50% um, a improvement, 1.5x improvement in their memory bandwidth. And so if you were in a memory bound code, that would be all you would see. And so this is one of the, the critical challenges we have, is how do we keep up with our memory, uh, with, the, with the processor in these kind of environments? And there's really a fundamental trade-off here um, across in terms of the technology we implement for our memory architecture. Um, we can go, um, so the examples here are, are all in a, in a kind of fixed power envelope looking at how much memory bandwidth we could get out of a fixed power envelope. And it's fundamentally tied to the, um, the amount of energy you need, to the picojoules you need to move a byte from that memory into the core processing elements. And so if we're using DDR4 DIMMs, um, then it's really quite expensive, and we can only get a limited amount of bandwidth out of those kind of devices. And if we look at the technology that the GPUs are using, they improve upon that very significantly. So, so HBM2 and, and the kind of um, COWAS um, in-package integration is a real miracle of technology. It delivers significantly better um, memory bandwidth per byte, uh, sorry, per watt than, than other kind of technologies. However, it's not the best that you can do. If you look at trying to implement um, SRAM on the chip, something like a, a global S3 cache on a, on a Xeon CPU or something like that, you can get even better efficiency. Um, but the approach that we've taken is to go for a pure distributed SRAM approach. So we, we implement only SRAM. We have no other memory within our device. And this allows us to really have a huge amount more memory bandwidth um, accessible to our, our kind of computational architecture. And so if we look at the processor that we're building, it kind of looks like this in kind of graphic form. Um, so we have an array of, of um, about 1,200 independent processor cores. Um, each of those is about 100 gigaflops. And if you, if you think back to relatively recently, 100 gigaflops was a, a very, very powerful processor. So we've putting, we're putting 1,200 of these onto an individual silicon chip. Um, each of these processors has local memory associated with them, and we get um, about 30 terabytes of memory bandwidth into this distributed local memory on this device. That's a huge number for memory bandwidth. Um, and then we're linking this together with an extremely powerful all-to-all um, -all exchange network that allows us to move data very flexibly within this device. That's what enables that BSP-style approach to actually function efficiently. If you didn't have that, it would be, um, be very, very difficult to implement this kind of architecture. Uh, and then we have support to ability to gang multiple processors together using high-speed um, off-chip interconnects to be able to, to build out sort of two chips onto a PCIe card and then link multiple PCIe cards together to build a big coherent system um, to allow us to, um, to solve larger problems. And all of this wouldn't be any kind of use to any, anyone without a software development environment that, that makes it usable. And so we're developing Poplar. This is our seamless development environment. We're integrating right up into the core um, machine learning framework, so TensorFlow, MX, Onyx, PyTorch. 
um, so that you won't have to go in and make radical changes to your code or recode into a custom, um, custom language. You'll just be able to use the standard machine learning frameworks. Uh, and then we're also exposing um, a lower level of, of C++ API and Python API if people do want to go in and, um, and, and write code that is closer to the metal or potentially if you want to implement a completely new network that nobody's encountered before, um, there'll be open ways of doing this. In particular, we're going to be open sourcing our, our high performance library implementations so people will be able to derive from our highest performance implementation to be able to take that and make changes to that and iterate upon that, which we hope will make it much easier for people to, to in, investigate and, and make new advances in this, um, in the field. And then finally, what do we get when we put all of this together? Well, we get radically improved performance. So if we're looking at a like-for-like -like power envelope, so something like a 300-watt power envelope for a, um, a PCIe card, which is, is typical for the high-performance um, GPUs today, um, we see in an equivalent power envelope something like um, an order of magnitude faster for, for CNN-style architectures. And we see this whilst at the same time delivering something like um, 5 to 20x lower latency. And so we get both benefits on both sides because of this architecture we have. And RNNs, where GPUs struggle a little bit more, um, we are even, even further ahead. And so um, we really see sort of huge breakthroughs in terms of performance with this kind of technology. And so what we're really trying to build in this discipline is, is machines that can learn and learn from experience. And, and so we hope that that the technology that we're building is going to help enable um, you, the innovators, to, to deliver um, these kind of machines. Thank you.